Let me first say how much I enjoy watching Genesis Week, the weekly series that you post on your channel every Thursday night. It's nice to watch the unintentional comedy, and it's a pleasure to witness the size of the straw man army that you have on parade, each one with a head full of straw, like you must expect your viewers to have if your intention is for us to take you seriously. Now. The notion that you're a member of Mensa may be impressive to your intended audience, but that hallowed organization's ranks are also populated by porn actresses and politicians, so membership is hardly an indication that your contributions to the collected scientific knowledge of the human race are going to be relevant, nor that you're going to be honest. In fact, going by the three episodes that you have published so far, I would say that you demonstrate this shortfall quite impressively. But enough of the pleasantries. Let's get down to business. In this week's episode, you take great pleasure in ridiculing the notion that something can come from nothing when you critique a blog post by MSNBC science editor Alan Boyle about a book by the theoretical physicist Professor Lawrence Krauss. However, before I point out the fallacies in your presentation, let me just read you a quote that you may be familiar with. It goes like this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, that is the opening first five verses of Genesis, the book that your Genesis Week series is supposed to promote. And I would like you to answer me just one question. Where did the light come from? Through modern physics, we now know that light is made up of photons, which are elementary particles that exhibit wave-particle duality. In other words, they can be a wave or a particle at the same time, with the modern concept of the photon being developed gradually by Einstein, but we will get back to that later. We see things as being illuminated because photons, moving at the speed of light, are bouncing off those things into the eye. And in order to bounce off something and end up in the eye, they must come from somewhere. According to the Genesis story found in your Bible, God didn't actually create anything for these photons to be emitted by for another three days. So when God said, let there be light, and there was light, where was this light coming from? And what's more, how was God able to put all of the photons that were moving at the speed of light one place and call it today, so that there would be a place without photons that he could call night? It almost sounds like God didn't know about elementary particles, and he just had them appearing en masse, spontaneously, out of nothing. Of course, with you having that Mensa membership rather than a doctorate in particle physics, you should, of course, have no problem at all answering that question. So, while you mull it over and try and think of a non-contradictory way of explaining the answer, let's get back to what Professor Lawrence Krauss was actually talking about, namely theoretical physics. The theory that you were scoffing at is actually used to explain why the universe is expanding at a certain rate, and why that rate is accelerating. I know that doesn't appear to make much sense, especially if you only know how to do number puzzles and you know fuck all about physics, but let me explain. Einstein postulated that matter and energy are equivalent, and that matter can be converted to energy, and that energy can be converted into matter. This is why I asked you about the spontaneously appearing photons in Genesis. You see, as a wave, a photon is acting like energy. 
However, as a particle, it's acting like matter, but photons act as both at the same time. This is all covered by both general relativity and special relativity, which talks about matter and energy and gravity, time and the expansion of the universe and all sorts of clever stuff. And though it was at the bleeding edge of science at the turn of the last century, not too long afterwards the United States Air Force proved that matter can indeed be turned into energy in quite a short space of time, quite conclusively, when it used gravity to drop a device that caused a small amount of matter to be converted into quite a lot of energy over Japan, resulting in air temperatures in downtown Hiroshima reaching temperatures more commonly found on the surface of the sun, causing some of the local population to literally become a shadow of their former self. Now, if we move on a few years, we get to Professor Stephen Hawking, who is quite an expert when it comes to gravity. In his book, A Brief History of Time, he talks about gravity being the opposing force which acts against energy, acting as a sort of negative energy, postulating that if an object acting against gravity requires a certain amount of energy to maintain its position against gravity, then an equal and opposite amount of gravitational energy is required to pull on that object to stop it just flying off. Because this gravitational energy is acting against normal energy, he terms the gravitational energy as negative energy, and normal energy as positive energy. Now, the next bit is really clever, and this is why these two guys are geniuses, and you are just a bloke in outdoor clothing with a rucksack and a rock hammer. Hawking talks about a hypothesis more commonly known as the Zero Energy Universe Hypothesis, which states that if you add all of the negative energy in the form of gravitational energy in the universe to all of the positive energy, which also includes all the matter in the universe, then the resulting sum total may be very small, if not in fact zero, depending on the geometry of the universe as a whole. According to this hypothesis, the expansion of the universe is due to there being fractionately more positive energy than gravity, and so the universe is able to expand, but more so, it is suggested that it may in fact be the presence of gravity that is responsible for there being a universe at all. This difference between the amount of positive and negative energy may in fact be as little as the amount of energy in a fundamental particle such as an electron. And this initial fundamental particle may have spontaneously come into existence, bringing with it the four fundamental interactions, including gravity. And everything went on from there. Now, you may think that the idea of fundamental particles popping in and out of existence is impossible. In fact, that is exactly what you've said, and is the whole point of your last video. But I assure you, it isn't. Physicists have observed what are called virtual particles, which are particles such as electrons and positrons that pop into existence for a short while and then vanish. Now, they are used to explain things like electromagnetic induction, the magnetic field between dipoles, and how semiconductors work. That's right, Ian. Without virtual particles popping into existence out of nothing and then vanishing again, none of the silicon chips inside your computer would work. There wouldn't be an internet, and though I am sure that you are quite capable of making a fool of yourself at the best of times, I would not have been able to watch you doing so on video. So, please, Ian. At least attempt to understand the science you're ridiculing, especially if it turns out that you're poking fun at things like Einstein's relativity and gravitational theory. Relativity and gravitational theory are what makes things like satellite navigation possible, which is really handy for finding your way about when you're out in the wilderness, in just your beige outdoors coat with all its pockets, your rucksack, your rock hammer, and your Mensa membership card. You see, they have a great many practical applications. Unlike your Bible, which when lost in the Badlands is somewhat limited to being used as either toilet paper or kindling or both, though I wouldn't recommend it as it tends to be rather hard to light. In the meantime, I look forward to watching the next episode in this series this Thursday. That is, of course, if you haven't proved that gravity is a myth after all and floated off into outer space by then.